weeks ago, Ryan and I went up to the Gila Wilderness and we spent four days, never saw a human until we came out, did 50 miles in four days, so about 12.5 miles, and Ryan planned everything out, and he's all like, you know, well, you know, Dad, this is what we're going to do. Well, if you notice, a couple of weeks before I even went, I was on a crutch, and I, I tried getting ready for it, and, I, you know, it's not like you're going to get up there and say, well, I'm going to bail out and just go to the car. No, you're, you're two days in, no cell phone. So that was weighing on my mind. I'm like, you know, I get up in there, and all of a sudden, something happens, and we call a helicopter. You can't even call a helicopter. Somebody's going to have to hike out. So if I got hurt, so I, I was very nervous about the whole thing. And I guess from my upbringing and the way that some things I've experienced and like going on like the Baton Death March, I did that three years. I knew, I knew what I was getting into. And I know that, you know, you just don't go out there and just throw a pack on and go out and think you can camp. And then I did down in Juarez, they had this race called the Chupacabra. It's 100 kilometers, 70 miles. Sit on a bicycle seat for five hours and see what your bottom says to you. You know, and it took some training. But, you know, even when I was training, I would work with somebody and I'd go, you know what, I'm, I'm not in it to win it. I know it sounds weird, but I'm in it to finish it. And so that's all I did. I was always trained that I, I wanted to finish it. Because to me, it wasn't about how I started. It was how that I could finish it. It was about accomplishing the ability to ride a mountain bike, you know, 70 miles. And even like with the Baton Death March, it wasn't about you know, how fast I could do, you know, 26 miles with a rucksack that weighed 40 pounds, can I finish it? So that, that's always kind of been my mindset. I've never been a fast guy and running. You know, I've done some half marathons and did them poorly, but I finished them. Um, so that's always been my mindset. And even when we go out and mountain bike today, if you go ride with me, you'll find out that I start slow because to me, I want to finish. I ride with some that'll take off, and I go, go, go ahead, go have fun, take off, man. I'm, because I want to enjoy the whole ride, the ride. I want to go further, enjoy more. Well, after that hike, and we're, we, we finished it, and my knee was fine, and set it at my pace. I put Ryan behind me, because you saw him. He's like a Sasquatch. He's got a stride twice mine. So I told him, I go, uh-uh, you get behind me. <laughs> well, I'm going to set the pace. And so we did. And then he pushed it. He goes, well, we're, we're going to do 12 miles and a half a day. And I go, whoa, I could barely do, you know, four miles hiking out and back. That's eight miles, you know, in one day. And we're going to do this for how many days? And I'm like, I said, okay, but I have to set the pace because I, there's no safety net on this hike. So we finished it, and we're coming down, and, you know, just gorgeous. And I'm like, we finished, and I thought, wow, it was just fantastic to be able to finish it. And I remembered when we started it, and you, 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 if you'll recall, when you've done something, started a project or something, you guys did grass. You know, when you start out doing your yard, you know, you look out there, and you're like, ah, and it's overwhelming. It's like, where do you start? How do you start getting ready for that? And then you get into it and you start going and then the heat gets you and it starts wearing on you or something else hits you in life and you start kind of going, Whew, let's take a break. Let's slow down. You know, there were several times, I'll admit, you know, um, I had stopped and lean on my hiking pole. You know, we we're at 7,300 feet. We got up to one day. I'm like, I got to breathe. It was kind of cool to look back and see he's struggling too. I was like, Hoo -hoo, who's the old man now, you know? And I thought, so, now there's some spiritual connections we're going to come to, I promise you. But why this lesson deviates from what I was doing in the Hebrews is because of this experience. One of the greatest ones you already heard me talk about last week was if you want to you get close to God, you've got to get away from man. Because man is permeating all our phones and our technology are constantly barraging. It's like this low level of static that's just a hiss. You can't get rid of it. It's always there. The only way you can truly get rid of it and get close to God is get away from it. So if some way you can disconnect and get away from society for a while, you'll listen and you'll hear God a lot clearer. And that's too with our technologies every day. Disconnect sometimes. You'll be surprised how beautiful God's voice is over what we're hearing. But we're coming back and we're listening to a sermon. So this isn't original, this thought. This is what kind of motivated me. It was just kind of profound. We're writing back and we're listening to the sermon. I think he preaches the Church of Christ in Lindell. 
uh, Church of Christ. And so the idea was, what I have up on there, is it's not how you start, but how you finish. I looked over at Ryan, I go, wow, how appropriate. How many times have we started out really strong, and then we don't finish it? Or maybe it's the other way around. You started out real poorly doing something, and all of a sudden you find yourself, you know, doing better at the end of it. You're like, wow, I did not think I could accomplish that. So this morning, I want you to go ahead and turn over to 2 Chronicles 14, 2 Chronicles 14, because I'm going to ask you, we're going to look at two kings. And we're going to, I'm going to ask you to pick one of these, 2 Chronicles chapter 14. So while you're turning over there, we have this idea of the, you know, not how you start, but how you finish. And that's, that's something we hear a lot, when, like athletes or sports team, maybe your, four, your favorite sports team, like the Cinderella football teams that start out the season horrible, but does it matter? They won the Super Bowl. You, you, can, you can talk, you know, trash about that team all you want, but they're the ones with the Super Bowl ring. They're the ones that have the trophy. And, they, oh, wow, they were Cinderella. They didn't have that. Yeah, and they may have lost the first four or five games, but you know what? They won the Super Bowl. And you've seen some teams start out, and they're, they're, they're undefeated. They're on fire. They're charging along. And like, whoa, look at that quarterback. Look at their receiver. Look at their demand. They, you know, World Series, too. And then they flounder, and they lose. And you're just going, what? And we've had a couple of Super Bowls recently like that, that, you know, over the years, it's like kind of stunning. There's a spiritual application. So I want to look at two men of God, and I want you to pick one. Which one of these would you want to be like? And we're going to take a look at their start, and we're going to look at their finish. The first one is King Asa. So think about it. Now, you think it may be a no-brainer. You, you look at it, but it's challenging when you think about it. Now, some of you may already know these kings very well, but I think one of them you'll be a little surprised about because of his reputation, almost like that Cinderella team that never, they won one time, but they're known for basically their poor performance all the time. So we have two kings, King Asa. And he's the first one we're going to look at, at how he started. And he was a wonderful king. And what is amazing to me is one of the aspects of both of these kings is that their fathers were the opposites. You had one that was an unrighteous father that was horrible before God, and they were wonderful when they started ruling. And then the other one who had an amazing father that was so righteous and just bad. So it's kind of individual, isn't it? It's your race. It's our race. Can't blame your daddy, in other words, <laughs> in this situation like this where we're talking about it. So let's look at Second Chronicles 14, starting verse 1, about Asa. And Abijah slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. And Asa, his son, reigned in his place. In his days the land had rest for ten years. And Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He took away the foreign altars, he took the high places, he broke them down, he took the pillars and he cut them down, cut down the Asherim, and commanded Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, and to keep the law of the commandment. He also took out of the cities of Judah the high places and the incense altars, and the kingdom had rest under him. He had rest under him. And he said, he built fortified cities in Judah, for the land had rest, and he had no war in those years. For the Lord gave him peace. Started out strong. It was amazing. I mean, his father had established all those idolatry worships, and he comes in, and instead of trying to think, well, you know, he's my dad, you know, no, he took it upon himself to be spiritual, to be right with God, took that challenge, and he changed things, brought Judah back into a good direction. And what's interesting about the way that the writer of Chronicles here does, is he not only introduces us to this, and he, these are young men, is that the idea of their relationship with God. 
That's one of the first things that both of these kings that we're going to look at is how it really highlights not just their success values, you know, like it says right there, but there's something else, especially in this story with Asa, because right after that, it says he had 10 years of rest. But then, right after that, we find that they're attacked by Ethiopia. And if you jump down, you see that in verse 9, it says, Zerah, the Ethiopian, came out against him with an army of a million men, 300 chariots, and came as far as Maressa. And Asa went out to meet him, and they drew up their lines of battle in the valley of Zephratha, Mesra. And Asa did what? This is the part where the chronicler is trying to show us. So you have this introduction of this king. He's done great things. The Lord is pleased with him. He gives him rest. And then when they're attacked, there's no way with the amount of army. He says he had 300,000. That's it. 300,000 men against a million. Just the normal rate of battle, even if he had ninjas. <laughs> with the weaponry and the way they fought, you could have the most... Special Force Elite Group of 300. And okay, I just saw that movie too. <laughs> 300. But they lost, didn't they? Even the Spartans lost. There's no way, naturally, you could win this battle. He could throw 500,000. He could throw 800,000 men and die, the Ethiopian king. He's going to out-kill everybody. He, he doesn't care. That's the way they fought. And Asa, you can imagine this young king standing out there looking on the battlefield and going, there's no way. And what does he do? He turns to God. And he turns to God and he says, And Asa cried to the Lord as God, O Lord, there is none like you to help between the mighty and the weak. Help us, O Lord, our God, for we rely on you. And in your name we have come against this multitude. O Lord, you are our God. Let not man prevail against you. You notice he didn't say against me. Everything about this prayer is just right on. I mean, he has it down. You, it's like, you know, a lot of times you hear people pray, you know, and you go, that's a good prayer. And then you'll hear somebody pray and you go, whoa. You could tell that person just knows they just have a different rhythm. They know that there's a connection there spiritually that is hard to achieve. I listen to men pray sometimes and I'm just like, wow. And look at the last, he says, against you. And then look what he says. He goes, there's no one else that can help between the mighty and the meek. There's no one in between. I know there's no one else. And jumping down to verse 15, um, um, in chapter 15, verse 19, we see, and the Lord bless them. They rout the army. I mean, not just beat them. Annihilates the Ethiopians. You never hear of them again, by the way. We don't ever hear about the Ethiopians coming. The Egyptians, but not the Ethiopians. A million man army beaten by this little nation that had 300,000. You don't think that didn't give an impression to everyone around, all the other kings and nations? And all because of wine. This man knew exactly where to go for help. He knew exactly where to turn. Pretty good start, right? I mean, you know, that, that's what I would like to be. There's a lot of Christians just like that. So let's look at the second one. See if this is, maybe this is the way. Like I said, it's kind of a no-brainer. The name, the name alone almost gives it away. If you know anything about Manassas, this is a guy that was... Probably he is the most evil king that they ever had. You, you couldn't honestly get. I mean, now, we can blame it on youth, <laughs> but you know who his dad was, grandpa was? Hezekiah. Hezekiah. Now, there's over 200 years in historical distance between Asa and and Manasseh. We're like right at the end of Judah before they go off into captivity. Actually, the things that Manasseh does help to propel that end to come sooner. And so you have a grandfather that was so righteous with God 
that all of a sudden you have this young man. What, what happens to young people? You know, I just wonder sometimes what happened. You, you'd say, well, my, my grandfather Hezekiah was so amazing and respected and blessed. And here I'm going to do right the opposite. Starting out at the end. So jump over to Second Kings. Second Kings are back if you're using paper. <laughs> if you jump back over to Second Kings chapter 21, Manassas, we find out a little about him. Second Kings chapter 21, starting in verse 1. Manassas was 12 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hezbahah. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. According to the despicable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places that Hezekiah his father had destroyed. And erected altars for Baal. And had Asherah and Asherah as Ahab king of Israel had done and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, which the Lord had said in Jerusalem, I will put my name. And he built altars for all the host of the heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he burned his son as an offering and used fortune-telling omens and dealt with mediums and necromancers, and he did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. And he carved images of Asherah that he had made, and he set in the house of which the Lord had said to David. Wow. And this is a man that's supposed to represent God's people. Uh, that's why, you know, I mean, not, not only did he reestablish everything, and I got him backward. I said his grandfather. His father had done, but he one-upped him. He went beyond it. Now, a lot of the kings, they may walk away. A lot of the kings, as you look at them, and you, you see that they may have walked away from God, and they started worshiping pagan gods and stuff. There's one place they might let deteriorate and not take care of, but one line that most of them wouldn't cross was defiling the temple with idols. And that didn't slow Manassas down for a second. He not only put them in the outer courts, but it basically, you notice he keeps repeating that. The writer of the Kings keeps repeating where he had placed all these paganistic offerings inside the house of God, in the temple itself and around. And even further than that, he sacrificed his son in a burnt offering. Wow. How do you recover from that? You know, it's, it's just, you know, when you think about that. So, I mean, I think at this point right now, if you were to look at the two, we would have to say, I don't know, I, I definitely want to be an, an Asa. I mean, that's, that's what we want. We want to look at that. Now let's jump back, if you kept your finger there, let's jump back over to Chronicles and look at how they ended. Because this is where it blows my mind. We know that Asa comes along, he tore down all the false idols, reestablished it, he's challenged in battle, he goes to God, he takes a million man army against him and he defeats them, he reestablishes, he calls Judah as a nation to become spiritual, does all these wonderful things. They say, wow, that's great. But look what it says. In the 36th year, I'm sorry, 2 Chronicles 16. We're down to 16. 2 Chronicles 16, 1 through 3. <clears throat> In the 36th year of the reign of Asa, Basa, the king of Israel, went up against Judah and built Ramah, that he might permit no one to come in, to go out, or to come in, Asa, king of Judah. Then Asa took silver and gold from the treasure of the house of the Lord and the king's house, and he sent them to Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, who lived in Damascus, saying, There is a covenant between me and you. There was between my father and you, your father. Behold, 
I am sending you silver and gold. Go break your covenant with Basha, the king of Israel, that he may withdraw from me. Wow. Do you know what he did? He went into the temple and he took the sacred items for worship and took all the gold and silver out of there and he paid it to a very evil king. Why? Because the ten northern tribes that were called Israel at this time, their king was fighting against him and besieged him and blocked him. So his move was what? What happened? What happened between a million man army invading you with your puny 300,000 man army and you turn to God and you say, Lord, we know there's nobody between the mighty and the meek that can save but you. Do not let man prevail against you. And he then turns around in the latter part of his life, goes into God's house and takes the gold and the precious articles and gives them to make a covenant with Ben-Hadad. And by the way, he's not a good guy. Ben-Hadad is a very evil man. He is going to help lead the fall in taking off of the children of Israel. And so this is something then, <clears throat> we jump down to verse 9, we see, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless. This is when, you know, then God's response back to him. And he says, is blameless toward him. You have done foolishly in this. And the prophet tells him, for now on you will have wars. Then Asa was angry with the seer and he put him in stocks in prison for he was in rage with him because of this. And Asa inflicted cruelties upon some of the people at the same time. They, he, now you know where that idea comes from. Don't shoot the messenger because of the message. And the prophet of God comes and gives him response because of his own behavior. Instead of being repentant, the opposite of what we find with David, whenever the prophet comes to him and exposes him for being a premeditated murderer of a man's wife after having an adulterous relationship and trying to cover it up and then all of a sudden David's heart he didn't turn on the prophet he dropped to his knees and repented the same man that had such faith to begin with in cleansing the nation and bringing them close to God all of a sudden now we find him robbing from God's house and then when he's rebuked by God, he takes it out on the people. And that's not quite the end yet. We find in verse 12, the end. It was the 39th year of his reign. Asa was diseased in his feet, and his disease became severe. Yet even in his disease, he did not seek the Lord. He sought help from physicians. To the end. What happened? There's kind of a little play on words, but they say, yeah, he started out running fast and he stumbled in the end because of his feet. It just blows my mind that, but it's not too shocking because we see this happen a lot. But it's, again, the idea when we compare ourselves, because that's what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to look within ourselves, and that's what I want us to do. So now let's go look at that Manassas. <laughs> the guy who actually sacrificed his own son. The guy who put all this pagan worship in God's house that to this day historically is still ranked as the most evil king they ever had. How can he pull this out? That's a good question, isn't it? Turn over to Second Chronicles 33, verse 10, starting there.
Then the Lord spoke to Manassas, and he said to his people, but they paid no attention. Therefore the Lord brought upon them commanders of the army of the king of Assyria, who captured Manassas with hooks and bound him with chains of bronze and brought him to Babylon. And when he was there, he was in distress. He entreated the favor of the Lord his God, and he humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. He prayed to him, and God was moved by his entreaty and heard his plea and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manassas knew the Lord was God. How could he look over that? How could God look over that? I mean, the hooks, what they're talking about is that they would take hooks and pierce them through the chest or cheek or nose, and that's how he would walk. They would make him walk in humiliation with these hooks through his body. Now, you're talking about walking basically from kind of where Jerusalem is all the way down to like where Kuwaiti is. It wasn't like a one-day walk. He walked a long way. But this is where we start to kind of think about, well, how bad can a person be before God says, nah, that's too much? And then you wonder, you know, you, you hear, you know, he humbled himself. Both of these men, Asa, when he was faced with the challenges of a, a threat like the military, he humbled himself when he turned to God, and God listened. We find on the other side where Manasseh rebelled, destroyed any morality or purity about their nation, sacrificing his own child, and then God punishes him. And remember the difference with Asa when God punished Asa? How did he respond? He was mad, wasn't he? Do you get mad sometimes like that when somebody corrects you? Come on. Admit it. You, you do. We all kind of have a little bit of that. You know what? Even if you don't take it outward, even if you don't like express it, when somebody first approaches you with criticism about your life or what you're doing, we all have a little bit of that. Bing! Just a little bit, don't we? Now, it's discipline that we kind of go, breathe. See, that breathing, that's a spiritual response. That's, that's t- relax. Take a moment. You know, you know what? I think that's what even James said, right? About being quick to hear, slow to speak. We see here where Asa, he had no restraint. It reflected honestly where spiritually he had degraded down to. So that when he was rebuked, instead of taking it spiritually like David did, he became angry. Here we have Manassas was finally at the bottom end, the most humiliated position you could have in life, being led out like a common slave. And he humbled himself. And, and God, look, look, you know, let me back up. When we look at that, it says there in 12, the Lord heard him. He prayed to him and then back over in 13, and the Lord was moved. So when anybody tries to tell me somehow God hates sinners in the way that we hate in the world, you're wrong. You're wrong. God wants no one to, be, to perish. And the worst of the worst of the worst, God wants the best for them. He loves them. And if you can look at Manassas and relate to him, you can't get really any worse than murdering and sacrificing and burning your own son. The religious stuff, okay. He defiled the house of God. How do you get over that? How, how could God overlook that? To us as humans, we, we would never be able to. Maybe the legal system somehow acquit him, or if he does some prison time, but we would never look at them the same. We could never. And we don't with Manassas. Historically, the guy has never overcome his reputation of what he did when he started. But with God, he did. He overcame it. Now, which is more important? The historical things that people write about you or what God 
thinks about you. Because I know growing up, every time I would hear it, and I actually, it was Aline Haynes, one time I was beating up on Manassas, and afterwards she came up to me and she goes, now Ron, you know that wasn't the end of his life. And I'm sitting there going, well, he was right. And then I went, and I went, oh, she's right. <laughs> so it's a little fitting that it, it's helped to remind me that no matter what we see. Now, is this an Old Testament principle? Is this, this something we can look at? And it kind of questions you whether you're somebody who has started out strong as a Christian and you're kind of like, where are we going with this? Am I the ace of Ron? Am I the one who has started out strong and now I'm going to fail? So does that matter? Or am I so bad that I can't start? Or, or is he going to accept me? Can he truly accept me? And it's just confusing, isn't it? It's just kind of like, so what are we doing? God is not change. He is not the God of the Old Testament and a new God for this Testament. The principal character of God has never changed. We are the ones who read his relationships in the Bible and reinterpret them as if God changed his thinking. But this same God who could look at Asa and take care of him while he was faithful and then punish him when he wasn't and then take a man who was not faithful, punish him, and when he repented, restore him. Go to Ezekiel 33. This is where we can really see another. This is God speaking through the prophets. That's one of the things about the prophets that we forget about is that in the prophets, yes, there are human that speaks, you know, like Jonah, Amos, Micah, all of them. And they bring a unique tone because of their character. I've always liked Amos because he's a goat herder and he stood up before the king and he told him like it was. But then you have Micah and you have Isaiah who were righteous men, educated in the law and things like that. But every one of them bring the same message but with a little bit of the individual prophet's character. So we can learn so much about who God really is when we listen to what the prophets say because they're saying exactly what God's wanting them to say. So now in this, God is using Ezekiel to talk to the nation of Israel. So let's pick up in verse 11. He says, Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back. Turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? And you, son of man, say to your people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not uh, deliver him when he transgresses. And as for the wicked of the wicked, wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall by it when he turns from his wickedness. And the righteous shall not be able to live by his righteousness when he sins. Though I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, yet if he trusts in his righteousness and does injustice, none of his righteous deeds shall be remembered, but in his injustice that he has done he shall die. So it... It is how you finish. It is at the end of it. Now, as I thought about this lesson as a whole, there's a little bit that I want to kind of bring back around that I cannot read the mind of God. God has grace. He has a favor that we cannot comprehend. And, and to know what your moment is when you finish. And it's not like God said, you know, start the race 10 seconds before you die and all is good. I, that's dangerous. That's just not right. You know, when we try to figure that out, we think about it. But there's, there's a part of this exhortation that we can learn by looking at two men in the Bible. One starts out really great, but he stumbles in the end. And then we have another one who started out so evil, and yet God elevated him. Now, there are consequences. Manassas, it says, returned back to power and ruled as a king. And by the way, no other king no other king that God removed ever came back and ruled again. That says something. I mean, it would be one thing to say, okay, Manasseh, I'm going to relieve your suffering. You're going to be able to go into retirement and, and just sit this one out. No, he put him back in and he ruled. 
and he went to town cleaning up and trying to restore Jerusalem, but he could not overcome the, the devastating effect of what he did. And it really did kind of pull the trigger morally for the downfall, the quickening of the downfall of Judah. But did God hold that accountable to him? See, that, that's kind of what we're wanting to know. Is, you know. I mean, it seems like somehow, how could he get away with that? But that's a human thinking. We, we try to understand what he's talking about. That's where we don't understand true forgiveness and what is counted as righteous. This afternoon's sermon, when I look at Romans, we're going to deal specifically with that. You notice, one of the things he talks about is he compares the wicked. The wicked and the righteous both have results of what they've done. The righteous have their good works. They have all these wonderful things they've done. Feeding the poor, going to Sabbath, so, you know, honoring the Sabbath, all the feast days. You know. And then you have the wicked, the immorality, the fornication, the anger, the violence. And, he's, and, and what is God stripping away? He's saying that at the moment, what counts is the moment right now. Right now. Now, when you're with me, and how are you? God is saying, I don't care how much good you've done, that if you have turned from me, those good deeds are not going to count. So for the Christian that's done a lot of good deeds, you kind of go, well, so does my start really matter? And like some people, they do. They have that attitude. You know, I'll clean my backyard when I have to. Or I'll clean it and wait till later. It's okay. You know, I've done it in the past. I've been able to get away with that. Nobody looks at my backyard. I kind of have a secluded backyard. I can let it go. No big deal. But then all of a sudden, what if I get caught? I've been able to push things off. We've all done that. We've been able to push some things off. But you can't consider that. So to delay... And it doesn't mean that God doesn't see your good things. God was blessing Asa continually. But for us to rely on something that we're doing, somehow that that makes us good enough, it cannot. No man is good in God's eyes because every time we sin, we're done. It's not like, well, Vanessa, he he sacrificed his son. All I did was take the gold out of the temple. Done. Sin is sin. It's black and white. Sin is death. That's the only thing that it can do. The law has to come in. Righteousness, justice has to come in. And when we sin, God's judgment and righteousness means destroy us. It should be our blood. So it doesn't matter how much you do that if you will not resolve your relationship with him, you're done for. That's the only righteous thing he can do. He can't, and you can't appeal it or anything. So let's talk about this this kind of idiom or axiom we talk about the not but. It's not how you start, but how you finish. It makes it sound like, well, the start doesn't count. Well, that's not the way it really works. They're both equally important. Jesus used it a lot. You will find this same type of a phrase, the not but, a lot. We go over to John chapter 6, we see in 27, when he's talking to the the Jews, but I'm just extracting this one verse in here, but it sets it up. What does he say? He says, do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life. So don't work. Quit going to the grocery store. Quit spending your money on food. We know that's ridiculous. You're a human. You have to. But what does it do? It brings the two side by side, doesn't it? It, it kind of makes you reevaluate the, the don't, the not, and go, well, I know he's not saying never buy food or never eat or never work for food, but what does it do? It puts them in a position where you have to look at him and say, I know that this one, the not, food's important. But, Don't forget the most important. And that's what he's saying. It's not that you should be unconcerned about your start. But you got to keep going. You cannot assume that just because I've started, 
that I can just all of a sudden now take it easy and not be concerned about how it ends. Another one, real quick, we see in 619. Same thing, Jesus is using this. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where the moth and rust destroy, but where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. So it's don't work, don't have any security, don't have retirement, don't do any of that stuff. No. But look at, look at the problems. See, it, it kind of forces us, especially in this one, when we look at our careers, we look at our income, and we look at the economy, and then we look over at what I'm investing in heaven and, and, and God and all that, and he's saying, quit thinking that somehow that all of that worldly stuff that's going to be eaten up by moss, it's going to destroy, it's going to drop in credit, it's going to be blown up in the prices and all that, that stuff is going to go away. You need it, you're going to have to deal with it, but what's more important? A place where nothing can hinder it, nothing can corrupt it. And that's what you and I need. Because you see, we live in the real world. We live in the knots. We live in the real time of all the economy and all the things that are going on in our lives, right? The most frightening thing as well that kind of hit me for myself is that the odds on how you start is going to be how you finish. It's almost a statistical odd. And that's good and bad. That can frighten you and that can scare you and that can make you feel good. Well, I can't code it. Because we do know. In Matthew 25, verses 1 through 8, Jesus talking about the second coming. And we'll go through this a little faster. But when we look at it, he talks about these ten virgins. Now, if you recall, he says that the ten virgins were getting ready for a wedding. And they all had their lamps and they filled them with oil. And they're waiting for the bridegroom. You and I are the virgins. We have this lamp. And we're waiting for Christ to come back. And all of a sudden, at an unexpected time, to the virgins was midnight, he shows up. Five of them were not ready. They let their lamps go low. And when he showed up, they tried to say, well, let us go get more. Let us borrow some from yours. It's like, no, he's here now. It's right now is where he's at. You need to do so. It's too late. And they take off. And they try to go get oil. But did the groom say, you know what? I'll give him 10 more minutes. I mean, they had been keeping it burning all night. They had been working out. They, they took the time to dedicate themselves to be there. In one moment that lapsed and they let that lamp go down. He shows up, and the door's closed. Now, that has always bugged me. There's a level of this that's always been, to me, seems a little unfair. Couldn't you have waited 10 more minutes? But you see, I'm judging fairness on human experiences. I cannot see the level the way God sees it and the purity of God and righteousness but he very clearly is telling us that there's a time that's coming that the end's going to be there. So in a way, as we're journeying through this life, as we begin and we start with our lamps full, we have to keep filling them, filling them, filling them. But what happens a lot of times spiritually, we let it go down, don't we? Sometimes it gets empty. And the awakening is the thought that what if he shows up? Can you afford to have a half full lamp or not one that's acceptable? Because you're not going to be able to say, well, give me 10 minutes. <laughs> give me a week to live longer. So it is. So, one of the things that I want us to remember is it may be discouraging depending on how you look at this, it doesn't matter. You have a start and you have an end. 
what each of us have to look at is one, understand that it's every moment that we're living that we have to adjust and understand because it is coming. And in Matthew 25, when he describes the second coming, when he shows up in Matthew 25 and he says that when the Son of Man comes in his glory, it's a frightening scene because he is literally, he says, he's going to take and divide people and separate the righteous from the unrighteous. And to the righteous, he's going to say, come. To those virgins who are ready when the door closed, they were there, he's going to say, come. And to the others, he's not going to say, well, I'll give you another chance. He's not going to say, you got 10 more minutes, you got a week, you got another life. No. He very boldly says that he will tell them to depart. And he says there at the end I have up there, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me. You cursed into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And that's what the Greek is well. That's what all the translations say. It says it very clearly that there is not a good opportunity for them to turn anything around. So it's not how you start, but the start is important. The point is that we have to continue. Now, the beautiful part is if you're not a Christian, one of the great things is that you still have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to turn ourselves back. And no matter what you may think that you've done or how you feel, worthy or unworthy, just like we saw Manassas, God was moved by his prayer, wasn't he? And so we see the same thing. No, this morning we are all children of God. And there's one parable that Jesus said about these two sons. We are all a son and we have to, we're going to be one of these. And he says there, Who do you th what do you think? A man had two sons. One went first, and he said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind, and he went. And he went to the other son, and he said the same. And he answered, Sir, I'll go, sir. But he didn't. Which one of the two did the will of his father? So maybe you put it off. Maybe you waited. But the end point was, which one finally was faithful enough to say, I believe and trust in God, and I'm going to do what he wants? To the end. So if you're with us this morning, and there's something we can do to help you in your relationship with him, to establish it, the way the Bible, the way we find that Christians were on the day of Pentecost, whenever Peter stood up and he delivered that sermon and informed the people that that Messiah that they had saw, that man Jesus, was the Son of God, and he very boldly proclaimed you had killed the son of God but he gave him an understanding he said it was a part of God's plan to use your evilness your selfishness and demonstrate to us that our sins will kill and destroy evil every time and God used that to save us because we couldn't save ourselves and when they understood that message they cried out what do we do about it what, what how do we fix it and he said repent and be baptized each one of you in order to receive forgiveness of your sins that's the message of salvation right there. But we all have a journey and we all need help. Now, this morning you could be Asa and get mad, and get hurt, but we know where it took him. It didn't help him in the end. Or you could be a Manasseh and take the message and go, ouch, ouch, and humble yourself before God. And his heart will be moved. So think about your relationship with him, and if we can help you in establishing it or reinforcing it, we would love to serve you this morning. So think about these things while we stand and sing. Watch and pray for the Lord.